Yeah, welcome everybody um, to today's talk, uh, Flink SQL Engine, let's open the engine room. Um, yeah, I gave a talk, a similar talk, uh, two years ago. I hope some of you uh, have not attended this one. Um, because there will be some slides that are duplicated, but there are also a couple of new slides, new animations to really show you how the engine works under the hood. So quickly about myself. So I have two paths, an open source path and a career path. Open source wise, um, so that you know what you're to whom you're talking, I'm part of the Flink community for 10 years. I'm celebrating my 10 years anniversary this year. Um, um, made it uh, to the project management committee. Uh, I'm among the top five contributors uh, until today. And I'm also one of the core architects around, uh, around Flink SQL in the community. Career-wise, I was part of various startups around Flink, also co-founder of a, of a startup that was acquired uh, by Confluent um, uh, last year. So, um, for those of you that have never heard of Flink, of course, I have also brought some, some slides to explain you what, what is Flink and what is it good for. Um, before I want to dive into Flink, I also want to quickly talk about what is actually, actually stream processing and, and what do you actually need for, for stream processing to, to work. So um, I came up with like a couple of building blocks that actually, a, a, actually every stream processing application somehow uh, needs to contain. Um, let's start with streams. I mean, this is stream processing, so um, you maybe want to have a pipeline where you pipe data from A to B. Uh, maybe you also want to distribute the stream to have like parallel pro processing or you want to fan out some Kafka topics to more Kafka topics. Uh, joining is usually a typical topic when you have multiple streams, so maybe you want to join them on some key. Um, maybe there is some mainstream and there is like a control stream from the side that you want to enrich. Uh, uh, sorry, not control stream, but like some, some stream where you want to uh, enrich uh, the main stream from. Um, and if you have these, these side inputs, these side streams can also work as control streams. So you have a main stream, uh, maybe an operator that is configurable, and the control stream basically um, configures this operator. And whenever there are streams involved, you also want to have the possibility to replay your streams in case something, something went wrong or there is a, f a failure in your, in your pipeline. Um, time is a very important uh, component as well. Um, and sometimes you want to, to, to synchronize time, so you really want to wait, for example, for the second event to come in uh, that actually was emitted at the same time, but you, who knows what the network did with the events. Um, but on the other side, you also want to make progress. So it's always a trade-off between waiting and, and progress, and Flink offers you some APIs to do that. Um, you can also set timers, so if the second event doesn't come in within two seconds or 10 seconds, then we are timing out and we are sending the event to a dedicated um, dead letter queue or something like special special processing path. Again, when we want to replay this whole thing, we also want to uh, we want to do fast forwarding of the time. So you don't want to wait another hour to, to process the events, but you want to use event time and like the time that is in your data to to, uh, to properly replay the time. Um, and the next two building blocks are very special for Flink. State and snapshots. So what is state? State can be just an integer, it can be a string, but it can also be a machine learning model. So Flink is very flexible. You can store an arbitrary Java or Python object in state. Um, state allows you, for example, to buffer things so that you don't have to communicate to the database again. Uh, so you can, um, or you can wait for more events to come in and when you wait for a special event. Um, you can cache data. Uh, if you don't want to go to the database, um, state can grow. You can also put large machine learning models in state. And of course, for GDPR compliance issues or whatever, you want to also expire state at some point. But whenever state is involved, how is it possible to actually perform a snapshot of this entire streaming topology, of this entire state? And how can I make backups um, of that and, and persist it to a cheap storage like S3? So um, backups are easy with, uh, with a concept called save points in Flink. Um, these save points, you can also version them. Um, you can also fork your streaming application, try out business logic, perform some A-B testing uh, with the save points. And of course, you can also time travel uh, for, uh, like from these uh, snapshots and then restore your application from there. 
So the, the use cases for Flink are very diverse. Some use it for analytics, some for ETL, some more for event-driven applications where you, really, where you really communicate with services back and forth, um, and uh, others just for data integration. So Flink can be like a very central hub connecting different systems. Um, uh, and, and, and moving data from A to B. And like data can be of various uh, kinds, can be transactions, credit card trans transactions, for example, can be logs from IoT devices, events, and, and all, all kind of customer user interactions. And system-wise, you can connect to Kafka, you can read from a database log, uh, and the same applies for the sync part. You can write to a database or a key value store whenever you see a need for it. Um, Flink is also used for like, various use cases. It can be something for like, like in the banking sector. It can be uh, in the entertainment sector. Like, uh, like these are the big names that we always drop. But of course, Flink is also used for way smaller uh, companies. But it just shows the diversity. We have social media companies, but also IoT car manufacturers and, and stuff like that. So, but this talk is actually about Flink SQL, so I really want to dive into the details now. Um, what is Flink SQL? So, I mean, everybody knows SQL, right? This, this uh, very, very old, decades old standard. Um, here are some examples just to, 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 for some motivation. So, SQL as you know it, you can do a hello world, um, you can uh, create an, a custom uh, table with values one, two, three, you can also read from this table, and of course, you can also join two tables together. Um, and we build this uh, on a stream processor. So we are abstracting basically away all the building blo blocks for stream processing. They are, they are still used under the hood, but you don't really see them. Uh, the whole operator topology is determined by a planner and by an optimizer. And you just declare um, your business logic as you are used to it in, in, in databases. So internally, the, the engine uh, d does its best. It will work on binary data and uh, like reduce object usage and all of that. And conceptually, um, you work with tables. Um, and under the hood, actually, there is a change log traveling um, um, in the stream processor. And what I mean with change log, uh, I also want to show you real quick. Um, you don't work with streams, you work with dynamic changing tables. This is a concept very similar to materialized view maintenance. So let's assume we have some, some standing query. This is what you define up front. Um, in this case, we are summing some transactions and we are grouping them uh, by name. And um, the question always comes up when people see, see SQL like this, is Flink a database? Um, and the answer is no, Flink is not a database. Um, you can bring your own data, you bring your own systems. So for example, Kafka is a very common um, source for, for reading the data. Flink is not a data warehouse. It does not store in an arbitrary format the data somewhere uh, uh, on, on, on disk or so. Um, it just connects to, to um, connectors out there. So when I have brought a, like a motivating example where I want to show you how a stream can actually be represented logically, conceptually, as a table, and how you can also um, convert the stream back into, t into a table. So let's, let's take this example. Let's assume we have this, this standing query that I mentioned before. We have a transaction table and an output revenue uh, table. And whenever there is some event coming in, um, you can like conceptually also see this as an insertion in a change log, right? So the, to the change log con contains an insertion. This insertion will be inserted into the engine. The engine will compute the count, or in this case, it's a sum, the sum, and then it will write it out into a change log, can be Kafka, for example. And when you then materialize this change log or apply this change log to a system, like, like a database table, then, of course, you will get the same result uh, out of the system again. So this was easy. Uh, let's do another row, this time Bob. It's another insertion. Um, and this will be also inserted into the downstream table. Um, but now comes the tricky part. What happens if there is a second Alice coming in? Um, we already uh, emitted something, a sum for, for Alice. So what would, do we do with the old sum? And um, in this case, the system detects that. It will produce an update before, 
first. Uh, this update before can be applied, so we are deleting the table um, from from the ta we are deleting the row from the table. And then we are inserting uh, uh, the new sum uh, for Alice. And as you can see, if you lo look before and after, this is exactly how databases work. The difference here is you go through a change log, you can go through Kafka and apply it to a key value store as well or to a CDC um, um, database as well. Um, and yeah, an applied change log then becomes a real materialized uh, table. And if you want to uh, save 50% of the traffic, there is even a, an easy way. If you, for example, define a primary key on the revenue table, then we can even uh, save the update before because we have a key, so we can per perform like uh, per key uh, updates in the downstream system if the downstream systems uh, system supports that. So we are saving 50% uh, of the output traffic, and we just need the update after a uh, message to update the table. So now let's really open uh, the engine room. Um, I have brought uh, some examples, uh, three examples to just highlight what the engine can do for us. Um, the first example is a very basic one, uh, standard SQL as you know it. Um, we have three tables, two input tables and one output table. We are joining uh, transactions and, and, and payments together, so maybe the, the payment system is an, is an extra system and it will then, when the transaction happens, send us some uh, payment processed um, event or so into the, into the pipeline. Um, um, since we know that the, the payment should come 10 minutes after the transaction, uh, at most 10 minutes after the transaction, we are performing a, uh, a, a time-based uh, join with, with a where condition here, and we are storing the result uh, in the table. Um, we can also make this a little bit more sophisticated and use some of the internal features that, that Flink provides us. So Flink has this um, concept of watermarks. I will not go into the details here because that would uh, take too much time, but watermarks basically make the pipeline a little bit more efficient and all you need to do is to tell the system um, how long does an event take at maximum. Um, in this case, we don't expect other transactions coming in after five seconds, so maybe five seconds is the maximum lag of the, of the network um, that comes in. The, the join itself remains constant, is exactly the same um, query as before, it's just the table declarations, the input tables um, have changed. And then there's the third variant, this time without watermarks, but we define primary keys uh, on, on this column. So in this case here, the transaction has a primary key and um, maybe sometimes transactions can also be aborted. So the, the result is basically updating. Maybe you, you retract the transaction um, that, that you sent uh, previously. So the, 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 the changelog mode of the table is actually absurd. And of course, if you have an updating input, you will also have an updating output. So in this case, the match table will also get a primary key and, uh, and this upserting uh, functionality, which is defined uh, in this option here. So as you can see already is that in SQL, every key keyword has a, a big impact. It can actually tri trigger an avalanche. So uh, in, in our example, let's just look at create table. Um, create table already defines the connector. So in this case, um, for example, Kafka, but it also defines the change log mode. So what will actually come in? Is it append only? Is it retraction? Or is it absurd? Um, for the engine, that really means what do I need to uh, what do I need to process, um, and also what uh, needs to be produced into the target table. Can the target table support updates, or is the target table insert only? Um, I mentioned it before, watermark 4 uh, is kind of a completeness marker uh, for the engine, so I have seen everything up to time t. So this gives the engine the possibility that, for example, intermediate results can be discarded because they are no longer needed. Or it also gives like a marker for the engine, when is the right time to trigger the result computation? Do I need to late for, wait for more events? Or is it safe to now conclude the hour, for example? And primary keys, as we know it from da databases, they define uniqueness. And with this uniqueness, um, for example, we can guarantee uh, constraints um, for the target table. And um, yeah, 
operators like select, join, and where, um, they just tell the system what needs to be done. And it, they also tell the system how much freedom do I as a system have um, to optimize. So like, uh, can I move filters around? Uh, um, yeah, and, and like, which join algorithm can I actually use to make this efficient? So after the SQL declaration is completed, we can really look into the, the planning phase. Um, I try to summarize the planning, the Flink planning phase on one slide. The engine is huge. There are hundreds of rules, but I'm, I, I just tried to, to, to summarize it in, the, in, in this slide. Um, I hope it's not too, too internal. But like for somebody that also wants to contribute to Flink, maybe it's interesting to also check out the code because it's all open source. Um, so as every database does it, in the beginning we have some parsing and some validation step. So the input is a SQL string, the available catalogs, modules, session configuration. Um, the parser will break the SQL text into a tree, a parse tree. Um, of course, it will use the catalogs to look up um, databases, tables, views, available functions. It will resolve uh, and retrieve their types. Um, it will resolve all identifiers, identifiers for columns and for fields. I just gave a little example here. What does that actually mean? Select pi, pi, pi from pi, pi, pi. Um, the first one is a constant. It's the pi function. The, the second one, this pi here, for example, can be a field. Uh, this one can be the field of a nested uh, data type, right? And then this could be the catalog. This could be the database. And this could be actually the table. So like this is, this is supported. Like you can do this very complex. If you name them all the same, it's very complicated for the reader. But for the engine, it's obvious what is, a, what is the table and what is a constant and a function and so on. And of course, it will validate all the input and output columns, argument types, and return types, as you, are knowing, like, as you know it from a regular database as well. And similar to parsing and validation, Flink will do the same uh, when it comes to rule-based logical rewrites, typical research paper-like um, things, rewriting subqueries into a join, applying query decorrelation, simplifying expressions. If you have something like a one plus one, it will be simplified to two. Why should we execute that during runtime? Um, if you're calling a function with a constant, then, then execute the function immediately instead of running it uh, during um, runtime. S simple stuff like that, right? Like known in every in every database. Um, and the output here is a CalSide logical tree. And by the way, we are using Apache CalSide, which is a, a database framework, also open source, um, for performing. The, we're using it as infrastructure. So parsing, validation, logical rewrites, this is common uh, in CalSide as well. And now comes actually the more Flink-based part. So now we are done with the logical uh, rule-based rewrites, now come the cost-based logical rewrites. This is already where more flinky stuff comes into play. So, um, 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 yeah, we are pushing filters down all the way into the source or even into the Kafka consumer um, and different kinds of, like, reducing aggregate functions. It's, it's easier to just have sum and count instead of average. Um, removing unnecessary stuff, like unnecessary sorts or aggregations and stuff like that. And um, now we're, the, the closer we get to the engine, the more Flink stuff will be added on top. So um, Flink has this concept of watermark. So this is like an operation or a concept that, that needs to be considered in the engine as well. So watermarks should also be pushed down into the source if possible. Um, and if Flink has like some special operators, like a top N operator or a rank operator, then we can also transpo tra transpose some of the uh, operators from an over window into top N. It doesn't matter. Anyway, um, there are um, important things to do, like uh, we, are need to, we need to check whether the timestamps that you're using in your, in your query are still aligned with watermarks, so you have not modified the timestamp in any way. If that is the case, we can really track how the time flows through the system. So there, there's a, a validation step in the middle to synchronize timestamp columns um, with watermarks. And since we are getting closer to the actual execution, um, we are now also having uh, physical optimizations. So um, um, things like a change log 
normalization step will be added, um, change lock modes are inferred and travel um, like are set on the, on the operator tree and stuff like that. I will show an example um, in a second. And yeah, the output of this whole uh, four phases, five phases here, uh, is a flink uh, physical tree. Um, and we are almost there. Um, once the physical tree comes out, we can um, map it to so-called stream execution nodes. And stream execution nodes are basically a list of recipes that Flink has built in. So here you can really see the list of operations that the Flink engine uh, supports, the Flink SQL engine supports. Um, you have typical things like a sort um, or a, a limit or a join, joins in various flavors because we have, we have past physical optimization, so there is an interval join, there is a regular join, there should also be a temporal join uh, somewhere, so here are also different algorithms uh, uh, that, that come into play. And um, yeah, like these execution nodes are basically recipes uh, that, that leverage the, 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 the building blocks that I showed uh, initially. So for example, a calc might be translated into a, uh, a map function under the hood. Um, and the interesting thing is that these execution nodes can be translated into a JSON plan as well, and you can also read this JSON plan again. So you can basically persist the result of an optimization um, uh, on, on, uh, on storage. Um, and yeah, this is the end of the SQL step. And if there would be some Flink expert on the lower la layers, then we would continue because the next one is then job graph and execution graph and more and more classes, but I will not go into the details here. Uh, instead, I just want to give you, uh, sh show you some examples because you can see some of these internals if you use an explain uh, in Flink. And, um, if you remember, example one was just a regular join, uh, no watermarks, no updates. Uh, this is what the parser or like an explain will, will uh, print you. So the first one is what the parser um, will parse. So this is the, the, the abstract syntax tree. Um, so two, two table scans, a join, a filter project, and a sync. So you always have to read it from inside to outside and some properties here. Um, and this is the physical tree after optimization. So we are reading from Kafka in this case. You can see that Kafka will give us only insertions. Um, and then we will have a join with the join condition here. And since both inputs are insertions, also the output of the join um, is an insertion. And if you would print that uh, in a little bit more uh, diagram-friendly way, this is how the topology um, looks like in the, in the cluster, basically. So it's, 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 as you can see, it's, um, you have operators, and these operators are parallel. You, have never, you don't have to deal with parallelism. The Flink will take care of that. You just define the SQL. And um, as you can see, if it's possible, we will execute the steps uh, in a scalable way. Um, so just an example, um, we read some transaction and some payment. Um, then there will be a shuffling step by key. Um, there is some state involved. For example, the offsets of the Kafka reader needs to be, need to be stored in state so that we know where we left off. Um, and then the join, the sites, each site is, is, is persisted in state. And this allows us to, when the messages uh, go through the pipeline to really join it together. So now we have transaction and payment joined together. A calc node is a projection and, and filtering. So we might transform the data into some other um, representation. And the Kafka writer will then, uh, in an exactly once fashion, write this out um, to the, uh, as a Kafka message into a Kafka broker. And um, if we take example two, example two was with watermarks, but no updates. So no updates means change log mode is still insertion. Um, but we have a watermark, so you can really see that the watermark has also pushed into the source. So the source knows that there are watermarks, and you will see that in the plan here. The join algorithm has changed because since we have watermarks, we can do more efficient execution. So we use an interval join here, very state efficient. And um, let's take a look at how this looks in the, in the pipeline. 
So, uh, as you can see, everything is the same except for the join operator because we have defined watermarks. Watermarks uh, require timer services, so this join does not only need state from Flink, but it also needs some timer services to clean up state, for example, or to wait for the other side to so that more data arrives. So, let's take another, another input data, again, a transaction and a payment, and the Join operates exactly the same as before. Um, it will join the data together, it will transform it, um, it will then wrap it into a Kafka message and send it downstream. But the difference is that from time to time, uh, watermarks will also flow th through the system. So if you remember, I think we said a watermark is, uh, I don't know, like the current time minus five, um, or current event time minus five seconds or so. Um, an important thing is if the one source is at 12 p.m. and the other one is still at 11.55 a.m., um, this will be recognized by the join operator. So um, if you combine those two watermarks, what is the minimum of them? It's 11.55. So we know that we have seen all data until 11.55, so we can remove all data that was before that. So the join can basically perform, perform some cleanup. Um, and then the, tr the watermark will travel all the way uh, through the pipeline and whatever needs to be done is executed by the, by the watermark. Um, so this is a very, uh, very um, efficient uh, join algorithm. And the third example was with watermark, uh, no watermarks this time, but with updates. Um, and you can also see that in the plan. So um, you will see some insertion, update after, and deletion, and um, since sometimes Kafka compaction might ha not have kicked in, so there might be duplicates, um, the engine will, will remove the duplicates. This is what, what change log normalize is good for. And uh, once the duplicates are removed and normalized, um, they will be given into the join. And if you have one of the inputs as updating, the join will also be updating. And of course, the, the following operations will also be updating. Um, and this is how it looks in the, in the pipeline. A little bit more complex because we have this change log normalize uh, node. Uh, and this time we have updates. Um, so here an update comes in from Kafka. Um, we as Flink see this update for the first time. So the change log normalize will make it an insertion because it's the first time we see this, and then the insertion and uh, the insertion from the payments, they will go in, and then the join will be executed as, as always, uh, and so on, and so on. Yeah. And of course, if there is another transaction coming in, another update, this time it's not an insertion for Flink anymore, this time it really stays an update because it's the second time we, we see this key. Um, and then it will become uh, an update. So um, even though payments is an assertion, um, this is an update, and an update instead of an insertion travels uh, through the pipeline into Kafka. Yeah, so this was a little insight into the Flink engine. Uh, I also just want to quickly talk a little bit about uh, where Flink is used. So, so Flink is used actually at a couple of locations under the hood um, and also um, in, at Confluent. So we have like Flink SQL uh, on Confluent Cloud nowadays. So what, it do, what does it give you, you as a user? It's open source Flink as you know it. It's just um, with a lot of stuff abstracted away. So uh, it just gives you like the serverless experience, automatic up upgrades, stable APIs, and uh, like what you usually want to have as a as a as a customer. Um, and we have like some auto scaling mechanisms so that you don't have to configure a lot because Flink can have quite a lot of configuration options. And we do things like uh, auto watermarking, so you don't fully have to understand what watermarks are good for. Um, and it's all usage-based, so if you don't use it, it will scale to zero, and if you use it, use it you only pay for, for what you use and stuff like that. Um, 
And the SQL um, is also like we use everything that Flink gives us. So um, like you, you don't have to configure the manual uh, manually how the Kafka connection works. You don't have to provide credentials to Kafka and stuff like that. It's all fully integrated. So whenever um, you are creating a table, this will create you a Kafka topic uh, under the hood. It will also create you some schema registry entries under the hood. It might, might be Avro, Protobuf, or JSON. So so it's like fully fully integrated, also schema-wise, and uh, you can just run your first select star from table, or you can also insert from tables into some uh, other table backed by Kafka. And um, like we're trying to fully integrate this into one unified platform, basically, Kafka well optimized, Flink well optimized, and they are fully integrated uh, together. Um, including metadata management, as I said before. And then you have like typical um, tooling, like you can use a, a SQL workspace in a, in a browser, but you can also use the CLI. And they are all optimized for streaming, so you can really perform a select star on your Kafka topic, and you can really see how the updates are, are streamed into, the, in, into your console, like updating in live, like, like you can see it uh, in, in this example here. Um, so the counts are really updating. Um, yeah, that's basically it from, from my side. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to come to me uh, also afterwards. By the way, I, I finally brought some Flink stickers. So if you want to have a Flink sticker on your laptop, a nice squirrel, uh, come to me afterwards. Uh, and after, uh, yeah, uh, anyway, uh, I'm also up for, for questions now. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, well, if that's not the case, thank you very much. It was a great, great introduction into Flink. Thank you very much. And yeah, if you don't have any questions, it doesn't matter. You can still get a sticker. So just come here if you need a sticker. Thank you. Thank you.